Hello, everybody. Uh, great to be here today. I wanted to first say thanks to uh, our friends at the Southampton Arts Center <coughs> uh, for putting together this amazing conference and also uh, Akwe and Tabutne. Uh, I see Tila's here. And to our friends from the Shinnecock Nation, also hello to uh, Stephanie in Switzerland, I think Edwina's in Panama. So we have people from all over the world joining us today, which is pretty cool. Um, my name is John Barrett and I'm a, a co-founder of the Montauk Seaweed Supply Company. We convert locally grown kelp and fertilizer into uh, locally grown kelp and seaweed into fertilizer and livestock feed. Um, and you can find out about that work at montaukseaweed.com. We got a lot of videos and news and things on there. Uh, and our headquarters is uh, in Montauk, which is squarely uh, in Montauk it, tribal territory uh, and the ancestral, and our, we work from the ancestral lands of the Shinnecock. So we always now just take a moment to pause it and give that serious consideration. Um, and to say, and to pay homage and just to say Tabutne, thank you uh, to Shinnecock uh, and uh, just pay homage in general to that um, reality. I think today I also wanted to uh, send out a few thank yous to the Carbon Crew and uh, Draw Down East End, definitely Dar Riley, who has been a champion and a hero uh, all along in putting this together. Um, Mary Morgan and my buddy Cray is here, uh, Joe Diamond, and especially to my buddy uh, Mikey Lieberman, who <sighs> pulled off an amazing feat getting this whole conference converted from in-person to virtual uh, was no easy task. I, if anyone's ever looked at a duck as it's swimming across the uh, lake, um, and it looks nice and smooth, uh, but if you look under the water, the legs are going like like this, uh, that's kind of been, uh, that's what you're experiencing right now. So thanks to Mike and to the organizers who were able to put this all together for a nice smooth uh, conference. And I think, um, and just thanks to all you guys, especially my panelists, uh, we admire and applaud all of your work. Everyone who's here today, everyone who's attended, all the, uh, the speakers and contributors, I think without the work that you're doing, uh, we wouldn't be able to do the work that we're doing. So we just wanna say thank you and express our gratitude to everyone. Um, and just to give you a little brief background before I bring on our presenters, um, Shane Weeks actually opened up uh, the ceremony this morning and he and I have often discussed just how in our lifetimes, uh, in our, you know, relatively short, I'm getting older, but uh, you know, in our, in our lifetimes, how much we've seen the effects of climate change locally um, from growing up and from fish that Shane and I can remember, a lot of different fish that we used to catch in the Shinnecock area and the Shinnecock Canal, the Shinnecock Inlet that are no longer here, different types of birds um, and that have vanished, species that have just moved on and, and these migration, mig migration patterns which have shifted. Um, and, if you grew up in the area and you and you remember like the 1980s, like swimming in Shinnecock Bay, for example, a lot of our local waterways and what the what that looked like and felt like then just a very alive and flourishing ecosystem. Um, and then you fast forward to today and there's areas that are like the surface of the moon, just devoid of any life and the water temperatures, um, you know, we've continued to break heat records year after year and people who are connected to um, the ecosystem and the natural environment have been able to witness this and see this firsthand. So all these alarm bells uh, have been going off um, as we've lost things like lobster, blue mussels, winter flounder that used to be prominent in our area and have now just vanished, have now moved north um, to the towards the poles to get to cooler waters. And I think we're also seeing an invasion of Southern species. Um, I have a long, kind of um, a lot of years working in seafood and on the water. And if you see suddenly species are arriving here that we've never uh, seen before, um, or in, in populations that are completely out of sync with what we're accustomed to um, in mass, just in large numbers of this or increasing instance of this, not only fish, but this past summer we had like wood storks and things from deep in the South making appearances here in this area for the first time that anyone can remember. So. 
Um, I think in the water though, underwater, I mean, it's the equivalent. We often say like, you, you can just see it faster and, and experience, I think the impacts of climate change, we're all feeling it. But in the ocean and in the, in the water, you can definitely, you cannot deny it. And it's obvious and flagrant. <laughs> and we often say like, what we're seeing happening with marine species migrating north, it would be like, if you were standing at the Eiffel Tower and herds of zebra and wildebeest started running by and you'd say like, okay, you know, that is very alarming. Um, so uh, I think it was Mr. Rogers said, look for the helpers. Uh, and we like to say, look for the problem solvers. Um, and our solution to begin drawing down carbon is to begin farming uh, seaweeds and kelp. Um, specific types of kelp can, ca can capture five times more carbon than land-based plants. Um, and then as the previous panel talked about, our whole um, vision and idea is to, uh, we're now converting these kelps and seaweeds into fertilizers, biostimulants, and, and livestock feed. Um, and getting them buried into the soil of local farms, lawns, vineyards, gardens, anywhere we can get these, uh, the carbon essentially. The kelp farms act as a, as a sink um, and capture huge volumes of carbon. We then convert that into these fertilizers and feeds and get them either into livestock or into the ground. Um, in, and we're hopeful, our vision is to, to really increase uh, this and invite as many people as we can uh, to join us. I think um, if everyone remembers 20 years ago, the farm to table movement, maybe longer than that, um, my team here years ago came along and, and kind of helped with the dock to dish movement when that became a seaweed, I mean, a seafood conversation. Um, and what we're looking to do now is create a sea to soil movement, essentially extracting carbon uh, from, from the sea through kelp as the vehicle, and then using that uh, vehicle and driving it underground, essentially, where there's myriad benefits for farms, gardens, for veg vegetation, as the previous panel discussed. There's also major uh, benefits for carbon capture and methane reduction in the livestock space. So we're all leaning very heavily towards kelp as being one of our key so solutions, and we're an action oriented group. Um, we're kind of where the climate action is now kind of really starting to step up. And I feel like today I put together a panel of some people I really respect and admire and have worked with in the past. These are all great climate warriors who I consider great friends. Um, and I think, so I'm going to cut it short and give these guys as much time as I possibly can. I also have a really cool film um, that uh, Dar had sent along to me, Sea Forests, from a uh, fellow down in um, Australia, Tasmania, who's doing, um, who's doing it's very similar work to what we're doing. And I think his vision, his ideas, his philosophies, um, that's also very important for you to mention. I think that a lot of the work that we're doing is great ideas that we're, we're borrowing or adapting from others. Um, Teela and I have had the discussion many times about the closer we can get to indigenous practices and indigenous uh, philosophies and ideas as Jason had spoke about in the uh, panel before this, like that's really where the true solutions lie. Um, so our key takeaways for today, um, we would like everyone to get involved. Our mantra is that we get by with a little kelp from our friends. Uh, so we consider all of you guys to be friends, we'd love you to get involved and you can find out ways to do that on our website, which I mentioned is montauksseaweed.com. Um, also support any and all indigenous projects. And, and um, there's a very important one that you're gonna learn about now. A uh, very good friend of mine, Tila Troge is gonna kick off after uh, this short film. Uh, you guys are gonna hear from Tila, who's a friend of mine. She was the first to introduce me to the concept uh, she explains to um, consider the juxtaposition between who the Shinnecock people are and how they've been treated for the last 400 years. And, and that will never leave me. I think uh, Tila and I were on a panel like this or uh, Zoom a while back. And I tried to have a moment of silence over that, uh, over that concept, but the screen froze and it ended up being a three minute or 10 minute uh, moment. So I'm gonna forego the moment of silence here for everyone today, but maybe if everyone could take a moment of silence over that reality. Um, 
And other than that, our other, my other key takeaway today is just um, the, the panelists who are coming after me. I think Casey, Indre, uh, Paul Greenberg is going to be here with us today. These are all kind of my heroes in a lot of ways, people who I really respect and admire. So I would say just um, go out into the world, find them on social media, really look at the work they're doing. And these are real problem solvers. These are real drawdown, car like carbon capture uh, ninjas and warriors. And I'm, I'm happy to call them all my friends. And with that, we're going to have a short video, Sea Forest, and then you guys are going to hear from my good friend Tila Trode right after that. I've got two young kids and it's their future and their kids' future that I care about. Living in a world affected by climate change when we've known of solutions, why wouldn't you try your bloody hardest to avoid that outcome? My name's Sam Elsom. I'm uh, co-founder and CEO of Seaforest company started to tackle emissions reduction a bit through the cultivation of seaweed. Always had environmental leanings. You know, grew up listening to Midnight Oil and camping and when I learned about you know, the trajectory we were on and the finite amount of time we had to act to do something about it, I became focused on trying to improve the world that my kids will inherit. You know, feeling a little bit helpless in a way, like a, a, it's hard for an individual to really feel like they can make an impact on the planet. It was when I learned about seaweed that I felt like here's a solution that we could really amplify. There's something like 14,000 recorded species of seaweeds or something. So I found out about asparagopsis my wife's dad is a sugarcane farmer. When we go and visit him, we watch Landline on the couch. This particular weekend, they were talking about seaweed and it was research that was being done on cattle using seaweed. And I was like, holy cow. It's exactly what I've been looking for. Asparagopsis, it's a native seaweed that when fed to livestock in super small amounts, like less than a fistful a day, eliminates methane. Learning that solutions existed and that weren't being put into action, I guess sparked the birth of the sea forest and just rolled our sleeves up and started growing asparagopsis. I wasn't even really aware of this at the time, but livestock are the second biggest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions in the world. I love the idea of the fact that we're going to resolve this problem of methane emissions out of cows. So I reckon this is the future of livestock industries around the world. So this is like essentially what the cattle would eat. It's just a handful a day. The consequences of growing this seaweed that captures CO2, that creates an environmental benefit, and then feeding it to cattle, eliminating the second biggest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, just held enormous potential. So there's a huge use for a native seaweed that can drive the development of an environmentally positive industry in our country. I feel like it's sort of like watching one of those lava lamps or something. The Sparagopsis has a, a really complex chemistry. It's these compounds that are responsible for the methane abatement in cattle. 
we've still got so much work to do. I do believe that there's an enormous impact that we can make on emissions reduction through what we're doing, but I also feel like let's not get ahead of ourselves. <laughs>
We've seen um, just this mass exodus of people coming to the Shinnecock Hills, fleeing from New York City. And so I, the last time I looked at the population statistics, the Shinnecock Hills increased population by 38% just during the pandemic. And that was the highest uh, population increase anywhere on the east end of Long Island. And so it's made the problem of the sewage runoff um, all that much worse. And previously, uh, people who had very large estates, the golf courses, the college campuses, um, they, they were only really used for a couple of months a year. And so um, we didn't see the amount of fertilization of lawns that we see now. And it's all just contributed to this huge problem of nitrogen overload in our local water that has killed um, almost 90% of the marine life that Shinnecock has depended on for survival um, for just, again, over 13,000 years. And so we formed the Shinnecock Kelp Farmers Cooperative as a group of indigenous women who not only wanted to be um, cognizant of the need to defend the land from overdevelopment and encroachment, uh, but we also really felt compelled to protect the water um, and try to sequester as much carbon um, and nitrogen, pull as much nitrogen as we could out of the water. And so we were really lucky to have a number of really amazing partners. We partnered um, with Stony Brook University. We partnered with the Nature Conservancy. We partnered with the Sisters of St. Joseph. Uh, we partnered with the Montauk Seaweed Company, uh, the Le Maire Foundation, um, Indian Collective, just a really great number of organizations really helped us along the way um, to get off the ground and, and, and really start um, springing into action. Because, uh, you know, a lot of times you hear about these great ideas, but it's, it's another thing to, to actually take action. And so um, from the start of the formation of our collective, we knew that we needed to take immediate action. And so it was kind of an interesting situation because in New York State, it was, it was basically illegal to farm sugar kelp. Um, but I did a lot of legal research and um, Shinnecock Nation is what's called a, a recently federally recognized tribe, which means that it wasn't until 2010 that Shinnecock Nation got um, federally recognized, which uh, just creates a special relationship between the nation and the United States government. And so um, we were able to, in the course of gaining this recognition, this status from the United States government, we used um, some cases. They're, they're called the seaweed cases. And the seaweed cases go back to 1640 when we had our first contact with the settlers from Lynn, Massachusetts, who founded the town of Southampton. And they're really fascinating, really interesting. Um, they go into depth. Um, they trace the importance of seaweed um, to the Shinnecock Nation's cultural practices, to our survival, um, just to the abundance of the uh, seaweed that we have here. Um, we have so many records of uh, leasing out seaweed lots to um, local aquaculture people going back hundreds and hundreds of years. So a lot of people kind of think of sugar kelp as something brand new, but uh, the Shinnecock Nation has been, has, has this documented history of doing this for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, um, thousands of years. And so uh, when we first um, were approached by uh, the Green Wave, who uh, has really um, been at the forefront of, of sugar kelp farming, um, not only on the East Coast, but also in Alaska, um, on the West Coast, um, it was just a natural fit and we were so excited to get started um, and just get technical um, expertise in how to get started. And so um, since then, I'm actually sitting in our, in our hatchery right now. Um, we've had a lot of incredible progress this season. We started small and I can show you, I'm on my cell phone, so I can show you um, a little bit of our hatchery. It's not operational right now because we just put our spools out in the water. We grew 20 spools 
Each spool had 200 feet of sugar kelp seedlings on them. Um, we actually had an incredible success. We had a um, what we called a kind words program. So we invited everyone from our community, from children um, to students, to elders, to speak kind words to our kelp seedlings. And they just did, they were, they, they did incredible. They actually did better than all of our partners. And this was our first season uh, growing the seedlings. We had, we had run some test lines from, um, from other hatcheries seeds last season, but this was our first time that we actually um, had a whole hatchery build out and, and put our own um, seedlings in the tanks. Uh, we cultivated them here for about six weeks. Um, and uh, we just put them out in the water in the Shinnecock Bay. Um, we're really fascinated to study how much nitrogen, how much carbon we're going to be able to extract out of the local water. Um, we're really grateful for our partnership with Stony Brook University, um, as well as the Nature Conservancy and Green Wave, who are doing just incredible things for our, for our local water and monitoring and putting the resources out that need to be out to, um, to immediately address this problem, because it's, it's, we're really in a crisis and we don't have time to, um, to wait for others to take action. This is something that we all need to do together. We all need to work together. And as Sean was saying, we need to um, expand our networks as, as wide and as far as we can. We need to get as many people engaged in this industry as possible. And so that's one of the reasons why we're so excited about the success of our hatchery. We only did 20 spools this season, but next season we're going to be expanding our operation to a much larger 200 spool hatchery. And we're excited that we're a little bit um, on the forefront because as I was saying, um, it's, it's, it was technically illegal for um, aquaculture specialists here in New York to, to farm sugar kelp. And recently, just a couple of weeks ago at the beginning of the year, uh, Governor Hochul signed legislation legalizing sugar kelp farming um, in both Peconic and Gardner's Bay. And so since we have a little bit of a head start, since uh, Shinnecock Nation has these reserved rights to seaweed and sugar kelp and cultivating, and we weren't restrained by a lot of the other restrictions that uh, local aquaculture farmers are, um, we, we're a little bit ahead of the game. And so we're really excited that we're able to expand our hatchery operations um, in order to provide sugar kelp um, seedlings to other people who want to get engaged in this industry. Um, a lot of oyster farmers, this will be really beneficial to. Um, the sugar kelp not only extracts nitrogen and sequesters carbon, but actually restores the habitat to make it more hospitable um, and uh, make it just a better environment where you'll start to see uh, the, the, the scallops and the oysters and the clams um, really come back. And so it's really been jarring just even in the past couple of years, the complete depletion of, of these shellfish from our local water. And so um, I'll just show you our, some of our tanks. We still have them set up um, here. We used LED lighting and tubing um, to, to kind of create a really good environment. We have chillers here to chill the water. And um, one of the cool things is uh, we, we, we built the hatchery by hand. So all six of us um, used our knowledge and plumbing and construction um, to really take care of uh, take care of every single aspect of operations. And so unfortunately, we're, again, the, the seedlings are all out in the water. So we just have photos really up right now. Um, but it's really just been an incredible, incredible um, journey the past couple of years. And we're so excited um, to partner with as many people as we can who are looking to engage in this industry. Um, and again, uh, a lot of times indigenous people get overlooked and we have thousands and thousands of years of traditional ecological knowledge and in, in, in the seaweed industry. And so um, one of the biggest hurdles is usually lack of resources. So despite us having all of this knowledge, um, 
resources are, are often the, the biggest barrier. And so there's been a lot of work done, a lot of studies done that show that when um, restoration practices are led by indigenous people, especially um, indigenous women, you really start to see very um, quick impact and change, meaningful impact um, when the land uh, is, is restored to its original caretakers. We've lived here for many years. We know how to take care of the water. We know how to take care of the land. And we're just excited to, um, to continue to grow our partnership and spread our knowledge to as many people who have the similar interests in extracting nitrogen um, and sequestering carbon from our local waterways. So I won't take up too much time, but you can follow us on social media. We have Instagram, Shinnecock Kelp Farmers, and we're also on Facebook. And you can email us at shinnecockkelpfarmers at gmail.com. And we're very happy to connect and to engage and to um, give tours when we can. I know the virus is a little bad right now, but we are definitely hoping to have everyone as engaged as they would like to be. Um, especially when we start to cultivate our first lines in April. Uh, so thank you so much, and I'll pass it back to, to Sean. Thank you so very much, Tila Tabutne. Fantastic job, and I'm excited to introduce everyone now, a very good friend of mine, Casey Emmett. Take it away, Casey. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Taylor. Uh, my name is Casey, and I am the CEO of the Crop Project, Inc., and uh, Sean and Dar have asked me to share a little bit about our business. In the beginning, or soon thereafter, there was seaweed. So before the soil, before the trees and flowers, before the mosses, before even, as E.O. Wilson wrote, those insects upon which the world depends, there was seaweed. It is a truly amazing compounding natural force. And as we've heard, it will play a vital role in all of our futures, not only in the biological cycles that literally give us life, seaweed accounts for more than half of the world's oxygen production, but also in the future of our agriculture. At the Crop Project, we humbly argue that we people, every one of us as individuals, but also in our working lives, have both the obligation and the power to regenerate those systems rather than detract from them. In fact, our future depends on it. And we can do this by transforming uh, that great momentum of big agriculture into a widespread profitable system of regenerative practices. As you guys know, traditionally big ag practices monoculture, focusing on only one type of crop, essentially ignoring the rest of the ecosystem. And this hugely reduces biodiversity and harms ecosystems overall. And this is as true for overfishing as it is for soy and corn. And in fact, there are a lot of similarities uh, between those two fronts. But we actually have the opportunity to flip that on its head. We know that regenerative agriculture is the future. It's a key to drawing down carbon, improving global health spans, creating environmental and supply chain resiliency, and creating millions of new green jobs in a multi-billion dollar market. The term regenerative loosely applies to both soil and water. All things, of course, people, animal, planet, microbes, being intersectional. Regenerative is a collection of practices that deliberately improves the health of the place being farmed. Of course, all these things interact over time and space and affect each other, right? For good or ill, it's turtles all the way down. So by farming and seaweed and shellfish together, for example, you are literally building more life below the surface while also improving the lives of the farmers above it through safer jobs with better pay. Seaweed has perhaps the most potential among regenerative crops. And you all probably know the headlines. This ingredient will be invaluable to the future of food, beauty, pharma, bioplastics, the future of fuel, and the list goes on. <clears throat> and a little screen freeze here. Uh, and the wave is actually moving our way. So 55% of CPG growth is driven by sustainable products. And a third of S&P 500 companies have set ambitious targets uh, for cutting emissions. 
Our company, the Crop Project, is focused on solving the following problem. Simply put, we connect supply with demand. We aim to be the plumbing of the regenerative space. Right now, there's a huge gap between farmers interested in growing kelp and companies looking to use it. The question is where to begin. Today, more than a third of the US market is for food and pharma, which includes wellness and beauty. Again, seaweed is useful for so many things. Um, my favorite to help illustrate the range of this crop, in addition to everything else we've heard today, when they identified and named the concept of umami in Japan 100 years ago, it was with a kelp. At about the same time, during World War I, the last time there was a thriving farm seaweed industry in the US, there were a bunch of farms off the coast of Santa Barbara, and they were using it to make gunpowder. Today, when you talk to some of our farmers whose families have been fishing on the coast for generations, they say that their grandparents used to use kelp for insulation in their houses. We actually believe there's dormant supply and demand. On the supply side are farmers. Not only can current farmers scale up, but they have friends and friends of friends in shellfish, fishing, and lobstering. These communities have all the deep knowledge and gumption required to opt in. Seaweed farming is complementary to shellfish and lobster. It is like those things, but is not exactly the same. There's a lot to learn and build. With our expertise, services, and our amazing partners, these communities can scale and pretty quickly. Not to mention, of course, that every coastal state and community has a huge incentive to transition to polyculture on the waterfront, as y'all well know. On the customer side, of course, the long-term goal is all those big companies making huge ESG commitments without a clear path to hit them. Our proposition is that for better or for worse, there is tremendous power at the top of the agricultural supply chain and the CPG space. And if we're gonna have an impact, we need those huge companies to opt into this movement sooner rather than later. We should practice good husbandry all the way up and down the supply chain, everything under the sun, farmers, processors, distributors, brands, investors, consumers. And this probably sounds pretty pie in the sky, but actually large corporations are finally making very public commitments to exactly that. Walmart, Unilever, Starbucks, Pepsi, even Cargill is getting in the game. We believe it's okay to have really high expectations for our corporations. Our friend Paul Lightfoot has suggested, in fact, that this will be the, the, one of the greatest consumer demand trends in history. So the ultimate target for us is soy. Replacing commodity soy is key to repairing the planet and an enormous opportunity. So just one example. Say you are a very large coffee company trying to cut your emissions in half by 2030, and it's unclear how you're going to get there. It has to happen through your supply chain, like your dairy purchasing. This coffee company happens to be the largest dairy buyer in the US. 40 million pounds of soy is needed annually to feed the cows for your dairy. Replacing that with the super functional seaweed product could have enormous impact. We begin with a simple plan. We buy from farmers at a living wage. We transform their wet kelp into a dry powder, and we sell it as a super functional ingredient blend to customers across channels. So we're equal parts taking the best of industrial ag and applying a layer of regenerative zealotry on top of it. Like Tesla says, it's just a better car. Our corporate partners expect the highest quality functional ingredients and we deliver on that. It's just a better ingredient. And oh, by the way, it's also having these positive downstream effects. So by unlocking shelf life, consistency and quality, we enable companies to incorporate kelp into their products Fun as functional ingredients. Along the way, we'll hold ourselves accountable to A, reversing the negative trend of profitability for small farms. Two, uh, build measurable biodiversity over time in the places we're working. And three, do our humble part to build a better model, model for agriculture as we go. So here's the trick and the true joy of it. This work will never be finished and it will be done everywhere. Uh, if you can think in your mind, you know when you're driving down any rural road in America and you look out the window and you see straight line of trees, block of crops, line of trees, block of crops, it shouldn't look like that. We will know we're making progress when every farm looks a little more wild and it remains so. And much of the future of farming will actually be on the water and it will be profitable. But the work is being done right here on every farm, on every coast, 
The solutions will not be hidden somewhere. They will be right in front of our faces if only we open our eyes. So in terms of action steps, I cannot overemphasize that in my experience over the past few years, local action is absolutely vital. Of course, you have your own power and your own habits and your own daily activities, right? Individual action matters very much. Build a garden, make more educated purchasing decisions, encourage, encourage your friends and fam to do the same. If you can, invest in companies that are driving this change. Go to work for one or do whatever you can to make sure your own company is accountable and driving positive results on this front. But it's actually in the coming together committing and following through to the brighter, bitter end that is really the only path forward. On the seaweed front, we should support those paving the way. The first seaweed farm, the first commercial seaweed farm in the U.S. was set up only about 12 years ago. This is a super new space for most folks. And again, many of the states are just coming online. There's much to be done on the local level in terms of building infrastructure, regulations, and to lessen, frankly, the nimbyism that is so common in coastal communities. As you can see in the slide prior, these farms are actually very beautiful. Lastly, we should build bridges and not burn them because it is only through generosity and great partners that will achieve our everlasting goal. So thank you to all the hosts and attendees for your time. Uh, and up next, we have Indre Rockefeller. Indre is a member of the inaugural cohort at Columbia University's Climate School and is the co-founder of Paravel, an industry-leading sustainable travel goods brand. Paravel's work has been featured globally in publications, including the New York Times, Vogue, Financial Times, the Washington Post, and Fast Company, and is the recipient of the Global Vision Award for its leadership in sustainable design. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for including me in this panel and in this festival. I'm so inspired by everybody here, um, and so and and for everyone who's joining, thank you. I think we're as everyone has mentioned, we're all in this together. So it's always a pleasure to connect with like-minded folks here. Um, so about myself, um, I wear many hats. I am, as Casey mentioned, a member of Columbia Climate School's inaugural class, so I'm a student. I am the co-founder of Paravel, a sustainable travel goods company that is seeking to minimize our footprint and maximize our positive impact. And I'm also a mother. And I'm a mother who thinks almost daily about what I will tell my children when they're old enough to ask me what I did to fight for the future of our planet for their generation and for generations to come. And so it's appropriate that we're having a discussion about the power of oceans here because my journey into climate work began with the ocean. It was a very cold ocean, the Southern Ocean of Antarctica. I had the opportunity to take part in a polar expedition with the Nature Conservancy just about exactly four years ago. And I was on board with climate scientists, glaciologists, marine biologists, and was able to learn from them directly and observe their work, which allowed me to internalize the experience of climate change on a whole new level. Uh, being in Antarctica was unlike anything I had ever experienced. It was like being on the moon. It was the most pristine, magical place Sea ice was literally glowing electric blue, penguin colonies swimming by, the sun was rising over these mountains of like, majestic mountains of ice. And the sound of silence was absolutely breathtaking. I had never been anywhere where there was no tangible human footprint as far as the eye could see. And yet I spent my days learning about the unseen human footprint that was affecting everything around us in this beautiful place. So the lessons I took away from my experience on the Southern Ocean and in Antarctica of penguin colonies dwindling because of sea temperature changes affecting the krill population, the sound of calving glaciers um, in one of the most rapidly warming places on earth, um, have really stayed with me and they have stayed with me beyond inspiring me to push harder on our sustainability. 
commitments at Paravel, it really was the experience of witnessing Antarctica along climate scientists that ultimately inspired me to apply to Columbia Climate School. And I had decided that if this was the crisis that I was planning to dedicate my personal and professional efforts to, then I knew I wanted and needed to understand the science of climate change and not in a superficial way, but in a deep, almost uncomfortable way. Um, and so I sort of threw myself head on into school. Um, but it was also the time spent in the Southern Ocean amongst these Antarctic ice sheets that inspired my interest in natural carbon sinks. And I know that's why a lot of us are here today. Um, it became clear to me that despite the destruction that we were taking part in, which is visible in our oceans, that oceans actually have superpowers and that as we humans are emitting greenhouse gases into our atmosphere, the oceans are absorbing them and pulling them back out. And oceans are not our victims, they're our heroes. And they hold countless tools that we humans don't possess and that we rely on to stabilize our climate. And um, oceans are our greatest ally in, in the fight against climate change. And it was this time spent in Antarctica that inspired me to start a project that I'm currently working on, studying and telling the story of climate solutions found in nature that we live alongside and sometimes in very overlooked ways. Um, and this also led me to Sean uh, and his amazing work with kelp and, and everyone here who's working uh, with kelp. So today I wanted to share a little preview of what I've been working on and a little bit of the day that I got to spend um, with Sean and Mike on the Long Island Sound. So I think if you all have the video, we can play it. Over the last 50 years, a single human lifetime, we humans have created more change than in the last 6 million years. And in that process, we've begun transforming our planet. Our weather is getting weirder, our water more toxic, our air less healthy. We're breaking all the wrong records with our heat waves, droughts, floods, and wildfires. The levels of CO2 in our atmosphere are at the highest levels recorded in human history, and we're not slowing down. We have a window in time during which we can choose the future we want for ourselves and for our children, but this window won't be open much longer. But what if I were to tell you that we have an ally? that as we humans release CO2 into the air, something is pulling it out. What if I told you our own backyards have superpowers? Did you know that prairies and oceans pull carbon out of the sky? Forests clean our air, swamps filter our water, and the soil we farm can trap and store greenhouse gases. What if I were to tell you that we've been living alongside natural tools with incredible potential to help us in our greatest fight yet? So welcome to New York State's first combination oyster kelp farm. There's a lot of reasons why this is a great benefit to the area and to a lot of the goals that we're trying to achieve. What makes kelp and seaweed so attractive to us and why we're so aggressive with growing it as fast as we can is its, its carbon capture capacity is like exponentially more aggressive than terrestrial based trees and plants, pulling huge volumes of of carbon and nitrogen out of the water. I mean, that's really the dream, to have an impact and start to reverse a lot of the, the damage that's been done and is, is ongoing. Not only to pause that, but put it in, in reverse, yeah. From our perspective, you're creating businesses, creating jobs, cleaning the ecology, capturing carbon, all of these kind of goals in one farm like this. When my children grow up and ask me what I did while the window of opportunity was still open to save our planet, I want to be able to say, I did everything I could. This is our generation's challenge, and this is our moment. Because as Jacques Cousteau once said, people protect what they love. So thank you, and um, I am introducing Paul Greenberg next and passing the baton. Paul is an amazing um, New York Times bestselling author who I'm a fan of and I can't wait to hear from. Um, so. Paul, all you. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Um, 
Thanks so much uh, for having me, um, everybody. It's great to see all the really tremendous, interesting work. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and um, talk to you a little bit about sort of what I have been doing and what I've been writing about and sort of what perhaps I can suggest for the future and what are sort of the problems that we can con confront as diners. So I'm calling this, this talk, um, uh, how to survive climate crisis and eat better in the process. And you can see me there in what's called a survival suit. Um, so appropriately done. I don't know how anyone would ever survive in this suit because um, I, it took me about half an hour to get into it. So I think kind of it's a metaphor for the problems that we have in, the, in, in moving forward with climate is that we know what we need to survive, but getting into the suit is the hard part. So anyway, um, who I am, I'm Paul Greenberg. Um, People tend to know me for uh, this book, Four Fish, The Future of the Last Wild Food. Um, but over the course of the last few years, I filled that in with a, what I call my marine trilogy, um, uh, American Catch and the Omega Principle, all looking at seafood um, from different angles. But as I sort of started to work on this stuff over the years, I started to realize that looking at, even though you know, fishing is my passion, the ocean is my passion, but to only look at it from the ocean side of things is to uh, kind of box yourself into a corner where you're only talking to the ocean converted. Um, so over the course of the last few years, I've been broadening my work to try and expand it so that I talk not only about fish, but also about how you can eat in the best way for um, climate purposes. And, and my, my pandemic book was this book, The Climate Diet, 50 Simple Ways to Trim Your Carbon Footprint. So, what was I kind of getting at with this book? Well, I wanted to bring the fish world into the general discussion, or let's say the ocean world into the general discussion about food um, and carbon footprint that I think a lot of us have been having. And it's largely ignored in the, those larger contexts. So what, what it comes down to really is that to a large degree, we're very much engaged in a battle between of land food versus seafood. Um, and that takes many shapes and forms. And so I thought I'd walk you through that and to walk you th back to seafood and why certain kinds of seafood is the way to go. Um, so, you know, land food versus seafood. This is basically on the left are the animals and plants that we really um, rely on and the animals and the fish on the right, especially those um, uh, bass, salmon, tuna are kind of the core kind of flesh archetypes that we deal with. The ones on the right, we'll come to know a little bit more through this presentation. Um, and I'd say that there's very much a land food America and a seafood America um, as sort of demonstrated by this map. Now this happens to be um, uh, uh, pilfered from the New York Times. The left is actually Trump voting counties and the right is Clinton voting counties from 2016. But I think it makes the point that um, there is a way of making food in the heartland of the country and a way of making food on the coast um, that are significantly different. And they're funded very differently. Um, Land Food America um, is really heavily, heavily subsidized. Um, the USDA um, and other agencies subsidize land food crops to a tremendous degree. Um, corn alone gets an annual subsidy of around $5 billion. Compare that to all fish in the sea that um, is managed by NOAA Fisheries, and it's only a billion dollars. So we're, we're really outgunned when it comes to money. And that's, I think, one of the primary things that when people think about a political solution, that's something that we really need to focus on. Um, and what does this emphasis on land food do? Well, anyone who's ever flown over the United States recognizes this picture where, you know, just literally huge amounts of land that could be devoted to all sorts of other things that have a higher carbon sequestration possibility um, is in fact um, deeded over to row crops as primarily corn and soy. Um, and all that is supported by literally these mountains of fertilizer. Um, this picture was taken in Minnesota when a story I was doing um, a number of years ago. And um, it was just this completely blighted Midwestern town. And I remember as I'm getting in this, I'm sitting at this, this, this fertilizer depot, looking at this mountain of fertilizer. And I asked the farmer showing me around, I was like, what's the name of this town anyway? He said, oh, it's Walnut Grove. And I was like, oh my God, Walnut Grove as in like Little House in the Prairie Walnut Grove? He said, yep. So Walnut Grove has basically been turned into an uh, agro-industrial wasteland um, with this kind of fertilizer dominating the landscape. And what does that do? Well, it all washes down into our seas and causes this annual dead zone that I think a lot of you are familiar with. Um, that dead zone 
tends to, it, it grows a little bit bigger, not to say every year, but it's trending larger and larger. It's about this, usually averages around the state size of the state of Connecticut, an area so deoxygenated because of algal plumes um, that there is no fish or shrimp to be found. The other way that land food, well, there's many ways that land food impinges upon us, but um, I like to show this slide. This is my home state of Connecticut. Um, every dam, uh, sorry, every dot on this map is a dam. There are over 3,000 3, dams in the state of Connecticut alone. I often say this is why people in Connecticut are so uptight. Um, they, their chi is blocked. Um, and all these dams, these, these are legacy dams that were built during the colonization of the East Coast of the United States. Um, most of these dams were mill dams for milling grain. And what did all these dams do? Well, they interrupted the energy flow between land and sea. Um, so things like salmon, sturgeon, owl wives, shad, all these things that were extremely important to, um, <clears throat> to indigenous people, um, to original people of the land, um, was basically extinguished by the land, flu land food rev revolution that colonization um, put on them. So, you know, again, land food versus seafood. Now it's also, what's interesting, it's also a, a nutritional issue. So um, land food tends to be primarily um, omega-6 driven, whereas seafood tends to be um, primarily omega-3 based. What does that mean? Well, omega-6 um, rich foods tend to be high in saturated fat, highly inflammatory and high in calorie. Whereas omega-3 rich foods tend to be high in polyunsaturated fats, low anti-inflammatory, low in calorie. In other words, all trending better for your health. So a switch to a, an omega-3 centered diet versus an omega-6 centered diet certainly lead us down a better nutritional path. And lastly, but certainly not least, um, is the huge carbon impact that land food has upon the land. Um, these principal crops, be they row crops or the animals that we feed with those row crops are extremely fuel intensive. So can we eat our way out of all of this? Yes, we can. And that's sort of what I tried to tackle in one part of the climate diet. Um, if you look at a rough comparison of the impact of land food, it's just out of proportion impactful upon carbon emissions. Cows, 30, 27 kilos of emissions for, per kilo of food produced. Cheese is really high. A lot of people decide to become vegetarians but keep eating cheese, and it is more impactful than chickens. And meanwhile, if you look down at the bottom, the average of most wild-caught seafood is 1.6 kilos of CO2 per kilo produced. And you know this kind of lays it out. This is um, from the Environmental Working Group's assessment of all different foods and their carbon impact. And again, you know, you see beef and lamb way, way up here and trailing out. We see, you know, mostly plant-based gets lower and lower, but look all the way over on the right and you look at mussels are a mere 0.6 kilos of emissions uh, per, um, per kilo of food produced. So what, what does this all mean for our diet? Well, you know, currently most Americans eat this industrial diet with a lot of chickens, cows, pigs, and then a lot of processed foods that are mostly soy and corn derived. And then a little corner of good stuff that we kind of think of as sort of side dishes. And so, you know, this is part of a trend over the course of the last 30 years, um, people have been hearing about the Mediterranean diet and they're switching to a more plant, some, some are switching to more plant-based diet. Um, lower component of meat um, and fish and leaner meats and so forth. Um, and that's good. Um, but uh, I've been lately promoting this idea of a pescatarian diet, um, which is basically mostly plant-based, but where the protein component is going to come largely um, from the sea. Um, but we can do even better. Um, we could um, go for frozen fish instead of uh, flown uh, because of a huge difference in carbon impact. Um, we could choose our seafood more wisely. If you look at a lobster roll, 783 liters of fuel per ton of food produced versus actually, believe it or not, the filet of fish sandwich, which is usually made from Alaska pollock and only 66 liters of fuel per ton. Um, we could also do things like for our appetizer, have an oyster instead of shrimp, shrimp highly impactful, uh, both because of the, the, the cost it, Kate takes in the energy cost in making and growing shrimp, but also the devastation to mangrove forests, which are great carbon sequesters. So we could we 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 like the pescatarian diet, but we love what I call the eco pescatarian diet, where we shrink down this corner of bigger fish and focus on these three creatures. And why? Well, so little pelagic, small pelagic fish, um, generally they are used for feed, for animal feed, for um, salmon, pigs, chickens. Um, we catch um, more. Um, little fish that we feed to other animals than the weight of the human weight of the United States. 
but we could eat them directly um, and we should because they're highly fuel efficient, they're high in omega threes and they're just really great. And the other two, which you know, is a lot of the base of the subject of this sem seminar and this symposium is looking at kelp and filter feeders because as we know, they do a great job in terms of sequestering um, nitrogen um, but they also happen to be super high in omega-3s, just like their little small pelagic friends. And they're very, very low in fuel consumption. So, you know, this is the way we're eating today with all these land foods taking up the majority of our energy and our calories. And these little guys over here are very small. But if we were to go something like this, where we shrunk the animals, honey, I shrunk the animals and made these little guys real big in our diet, that we might come to a point of balance uh, with the planet. Um, and so if anyone wants any more information, they can go to my website, um, all my books are there. Um, and if you have a fish story, please let me know through these channels. And I'm also uh, now a um, commissioned contributor to Medium, and I hope you'll log on to Medium and um, have a look at some of the stories that I'm developing there over time. Holy smokes, fantastic job, you guys. Thank you so very much, Paul, Indre, Casey, Tila. Thank you, and Tabutne. Um, that was awesome. I could listen to you guys all day and I'm just feeling inspired and I have a nice little to-do list here of uh, refresh things I'm gonna, and actions I'm going to take after uh, everyone spoke. So I just got a note from uh, Mikey that we're going to do a little Q&A. So if anyone has any questions that they'd like to put into the chat, I'll see if we can field these here. Uh, Paul Greenberg, June Hament, what are some of the best quote unquote little fish that folks can eat? Good question. Um, in fact, it's funny, um, Sean, I don't know, you know Dave Pasternak, right? Yeah, yeah, Chef Dave. So, so Chef Dave and I are actually doing a story for the New York Times uh, next month where we're going out local herring fishing out of the New York Bight. So herring, nice. a lot of people don't realize this, but there's a tremendous winter herring run that we get off of um, our coasts here. Um, you don't have to catch those herring, you can get them pickled and so forth. Um, you know, the best thing that you can do though, if you're turning, wanting to change the dynamic around forage fish, these little guys being fed to animals, get anchovies, but look for anchovies that are product of Peru. Why? Because Peruvian anchoveta are the largest single species fishery in the world, sometimes as many as five to 10 million metric tons. Only okay. less than 1% of that fishery goes to feeding humans. The more market demand we can take for that, uh, those, the better. Did you lose me there, Sean? Yep, we got you loud and clear, Paul. No, it might have been my screen that froze, but yeah, that's a great answer. So for small fish, uh, small fish, it sounds like, Paul, uh, if you can get Chef Dave to chef you up some local herring, uh, <laughs> that's definitely one way to go. Otherwise, you, Peru, Peruvian and Chavetta, but uh, Sean, do you do you ever do you guys ever offer herring in your box in your Doctor Dish boxes? Uh, we don't. Once in a blue moon, we will get herring, but there's it's a it's a it's a rare fishery just because the net sizes are often small. There's no hand lining for that, so uh, yeah. we don't usually use mesh uh, sizes in commercial fisheries locally that would catch uh, fish that small. So it's rare, but we do get them um, from time to time. Occasionally, some of the bonic guys, if you've ever seen. Um, some of the art, more artisanal uh, guys in our fleet, will, they know secret spots and places to go where they can catch them, but it's very limited. Your friend Dan Barber up at Blue Hill makes uh, kippers. He's a big fan anytime yeah, yeah. you get And I'm seeing in the chat, every, there's a bunch of people, what about sardines? What about sardines? Um, sardines are cool, eat the sardines, um, but I'd also caution you, be a little careful about sardines from Europe because I do believe, especially anchovies and sardines from the Mediterranean, um, Mediterranean is in such bad shape that we want to kind of back off if we can. Yeah, great. And I think uh, for that, for those questions, I personally have found, and Casey also just uh, privately messaged me, that Paul's books, uh, without being a salesman here for Paul, though I, I always am because I'm a firm believer, all of Paul's books really do give you a, an incredibly good background and an on-ramp into understanding the, the, the broader seafood scene. So that would be, there we go, paulgreenberg.org. Okay, we have some more questions in the chat here. We got to sardines. Um, Paul, this is another one aimed at you. What's the safest fish to eat with respect to toxins? Yeah, well, I mean, again, our little pelagic guys, right? Small pelagics, um, sardines, anchovies, herring, they all have very short lives and um, 
are non-predatory, or, or I should say they prey on plankton. So the lower you eat on the food chain and the shorter your life, the fewer toxins you're likely to carry. So those are the ones to look at. Wild salmon from Alaska, um, particularly sockeye salmon is pretty low, um, and quite low actually. So um, when I think about what I eat, um, I'm mostly vegan, but I, as I say, I'm pescatarian, eco-pescatarian. And so what I eat is, uh, if I'm gonna eat fish, generally speaking, it's the fish that I catch, just because I do, um, sockeye salmon from Alaska, mussels, clams, oysters, and um, sardines, anchovies, herring, plus whatever Sean sends me. <laughs> All right, right. And I think I learned from Paul and our friend Carl Safina also taught us about this uh, concept of bioaccumulation. So the larger fish get, the more they tend to um, concentrate mercuries and things like that. So if everyone from high school science or remembers that, the um, trophic scale, the pyramid of seaweed, the lower down you are down there, the smaller fish, clams, oysters, things like that, especially kelp, eat more kelp, algaes, anything that are on the very bottom line of uh, the base of that triangle are typically uh, the safest to eat and the most abundant and regenerative. Okay, I see two quick questions here. One is how receptive has the fishing industry been to the algae farming slash shellfish idea. And I think uh, that's coming from Francesca. Hi, Francesca, by the way. Uh, happy to see you here today. And I think um, so far, so good. Uh, you, as you know, the, the commercial fishing industry can be very insular and resistant to change for good reason. Uh, and often there's um, kind of can be disruptions in that space, but so far, so good. As Casey had mentioned in his, um, presentation earlier, which was accurate. This is complementary. So a lot of the oyster farmers are um, starting to take to kelp farming because it's uh, a polyculture. It turns their monoculture farm into a polyculture farm, which has a lot of benefits. And also a lot of the commercial fishermen don't really fish in the places where um, your kelp farms are going to be, especially not in New York state waters. For the phase that we're in right now, most of the kelp farming is inshore waters where Tila had mentioned in Shinnecock Bay and the Great South Bay. We just legalized kelp farming in um, Gardner's Bay and Peconic Bay. So there's, I mean, there is commercial fishing in those places, but so far we haven't really had very much, um, you know, it's complementary and harmonious so far. So Knockwood, um, everyone kind of sees this as a, as a good thing and is, is cooperating and moving forward. I see another question in here from Fountain Financial, Tila, this would be a good question for you. What's the best way to start a seaweed farm? Tila? Is Tila still here? Uh, Tila may have had to, uh, I don't see Tila still with us. She would be, oh, she had another engagement, SAC just told me. Okay, um, so that, that, that's a really good question. I would save that. I'm not a kelp farmer. Um, myself and I don't, uh, it's a, it's a tricky zone. I think, um, especially in New York, there's layers and layers of complexity. The route that we're going right now, um, is to start retro or fitting, uh, existing oyster farmers who, as Casey had mentioned, um, there's a lot of knowledge and experience that you need to have with the local waterways, laws, different peculiar things about ecosystems to, uh, to have the, your your kelp farm succeed uh, and to get permitting and a lot of this stuff is just becoming like legal in New York State right now we literally just passed the kelp bill uh, within the last six months to make a lot of this stuff legal so um, for right now I would say probably Tila Troj if and I advise and encourage everyone to try to find Tila and the Shinnecock kelp farmers uh, on their Instagram page which I put in the chat um, she would be the best person to direct how do you start one from scratch uh, it takes a uh, village for sure. Um, and Tila would be the best one to answer that. Sean, does, um, does, does Bren Smith at Greenwave have a, like any kind of, you know, information on their site? Uh, yeah, probably greenwave.org has some information on, on their site. Um, but they, if you look at the, the chain of like the kelp, how it's uh, the supply chain, um, the farming and kind of the nursery space that Tila talked about, a lot of that uh, incubator um, and, and the, the kind of like the beginning of the chain, we really occupy the, the other end of the chain where the rubber meets the road in, in penetrating the marketplace and creating um, little economies that is ultimately pays these farmers for their, um, where Casey and I kind of operate is in that space. So 
Greenway would be a good place to look for information on this. Also, um, Atlantic Sea Farms up in Maine, they're really kind of the preeminent East Coast uh, established operation organization and, and uh, their website, Atlantic Sea Farms, you can find them too. They have a lot of good, good info about this. Okay, I see a question from Sheila for Indre, wondering what you would be doing after school is done. <laughs> I probably wonder that at least once a day. Um, so I still have um, the company I co-founded that I mentioned, Paravel, is I'm, I'm still involved in. We are really working towards taking um, this idea of what is a sustainable brand and just really trying to reimagine that. That word to me in general is something that is has become means so much to everyone that almost means nothing and trying to really reframe the conversation, especially in travel and consumer goods and um, production and what that means alongside, you know, travel and consumerism and these industries that are generating a lot of waste, but want to um, reframe the conversation. So certainly um, continuing some of the work there I'm doing and really hoping to focus on the sort of content storytelling side of the equation. I have been, so in all my, I'm like a cat with nine lives. I've had a lot of different careers. I was in, um, I was a ballet dancer uh, until an injury, um, a back injury took me out. I was in uh, the fashion industry and in the art world. So one thing I've always loved that's connected all the dots is this idea of storytelling. And I think that this crisis, the climate crisis, one, one way that to approach it is to sort of tell stories and connect with people and build community um, and, and create the, like a unifying lens through which we all can solve this together. Um, so that is something that I hope to contribute to. Thank you for asking. Nice. Uh, okay. Wow. So many good questions here. I see one here from my buddy, Casey. Uh, this is coming from Sheila, and she's asking, does your company do education with livestock farmers to get them to convert to kelp feed versus soy? Actually, I feel like this is more in your camp, Sean. <clears throat> uh, not yet, but Sean does. <laughs> A little ping pong there from Casey. So, yeah, Sheila, we've, we've been pushing through with, uh, with the, uh, there's really there are three Fs that we talk about as far as outputs uh, with kelp farming, and it's either food uh, where Casey largely is. The center one is feed and fertilizer. Those are kind of combined. So I guess there's four Fs, but in that center uh, section is feed and fertilizer combined. So that kind of falls into my wheelhouse. The third is fuel, biofuels, which that's well beyond Casey and my capacity. That's Jeff Bezos type of stuff, uh, converting kelp and macroalgae into fuel. So in the feed and fuel, um, category. We've just become New York State's first uh, authorized distributor from the New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets for livestock feed using macroalgae that we're converting from uh, the sea. We have not yet taken a dive into like educating your question about education with livestock farmers to get them to convert to kelp feed versus soy. We don't really have, we're a little small business, like a bootstrap startup. So we don't really have the capacity to do education as or the bandwidth or the manpower at this time. So we, we strategically align ourselves with a lot of dot orgs, nonprofits, um, dot edus and folks who do do that. And who we've been working most closely with on this is uh, Stone Barn Center in Westchester County and Jack Algier and Shane, a bunch of their farmers there. We've been running a lot of samples and doing a lot of testing to try to figure out um, how sugar kelp is gonna fit into the livestock feed kind of conversation there. And everyone's super excited, especially uh, the goats and the sheep and the cattle are apparently think this is the most delicious thing they've ever had. And the biggest problem that we're running into is that the goats will specifically try to get to the whole bag, whether that means jumping over gates, but we, they eat out all the supplies of the, of the kelp and seed we were bringing there. So, we're still in the phase where we're fixing those little, figuring out those little problems and not yet, uh, Sheila, near the place where we're doing education for- uh... yeah. The only thing that I would add to that for, for context, not to totally kick the can over to Sean, but um, that so many of these things, like almost everything that we're talking about, these are very traditional practices. So, you know, whereas it's not necessarily being used right now for commodity soy or, you know, for commodity agriculture or big ag and pens and all those things, um, 
you can talk to many, even up the Hudson Valley, like many dairy farmers um, have been using seaweeds for a really long time. And, um, you know, like Sean said, it's, um, it's, the, the cows have no problem eating this. It's just a matter of if, if it's really going to scale and the big hill to climb is, to Paul's point earlier, soy is very cheap. Um, and so how do you, over time, how do you match up those two things of, uh, you know, actually providing, um, you know, additive or really, really good income uh, for folks who are actually farming this stuff? but also allow a lot of these um, commodity uh, dairy folks to transition over because the cost is not incon inconsequential. Yeah, definitely important facts uh, and points there, Casey. And I think um, I see another question in here that just arrived it says, what is the best resource to review to determine the cleanliness of local water bodies on Long Island? And I think it's been my experience um, that the center of that universe really is Stony Brook University and a specific person there, a, a good friend and a great inspiration, Dr. Chris Gobler. Um, he's kind of our Obi-Wan Kenobi of water uh, health. Every year he puts on a, um, a very, very informative demonstration where he gathers all the science from all the local waterways, all the testing, all the data and presents it in something called the State of the Bays Address. So I've, I've been, we used to go to it personally in the before times before COVID. Now in the last two or three years, it's all been online. And even if you're just remotely interested in this, I mean, I love the oceans and water and I'm fascinated uh, by Dr. Gobler's work, but I strongly recommend going to YouTube and checking out the state of the bays, especially from last year, we were just stunned. Uh, as Tila had mentioned, the pandemic caused a major migration pattern shift of people moving out to the East End um, from the city. This also happened after 9-11 where the schools all, you know, everyone who lived in the city but had a second home out East, um, they all kind of, you know, switched that around and became permanent residents. Well, Suffolk County is not really designed for that population density and where we're seeing that most, and Dr. Gobler gets very deeply detailed into this in the state of the Bays address, um, is the nitrogen loading situation and how much of our <laughs> nitrogen is making its way now into our, our water. In that presentation from last year, you'll see that we just passed the point of, uh, we're now in the, in the highest 5% of nitrogen uh, loading in our drinking water, which puts us into the CDC considers that a contamination range and puts everyone at really kind of risk, uh, a whole series of risks from health risks. So uh, that was kind of maybe a long way to answer it. I would say the shortest way to answer this question, what's the best resource? Uh, Dr. Chris Gobler at Stony Brook University and State of the Bays Address uh, on YouTube. See ya. <laughs>